All right, everybody's getting settled in. Um, for the record, State of Florida versus Ashley MacArthur, 17 CF 5844. Defendant is present with counsel. Assistant State Attorney is present. And I believe the jury's ready. So let's go get them. Okay, y'all may have a seat. Defendant is present with counsel. Assistant State Attorney is present. Ma'am, just go ahead and move. Ma'am in the corner, just go ahead and move and have a seat. I have to have my court security sit back there. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Barry Barasset. May it please the court. Ms. Jensen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be the only opportunity I'm going to have to talk to you. In behalf of my son, John, myself, and my client, I want to thank you for listening attentively to the evidence throughout the course of this trial. I know it's difficult for you to be away from your work and your families, and, and as the judges commented, we, we've all recognized that you've been paying very close attention. So I'm not probably going to take an hour and 15 minutes to go over things that you've already seen, but I want to address several important parts. You've heard all the evidence. There is no other evidence that you're going to have in this case. It's all in court now, whether there's a conflict, lack of evidence, or the evidence itself. Ms. MacArthur is charged with first-degree premeditated murder. That means that you must believe that she has committed a murder. They have to prove three things, as the state has said, that Ashley, or that Taylor Wright is dead, and that Ashley MacArthur caused the death by a criminal act by shooting and that it was premeditated. She is not charged with stealing any money. She's not charged with lying. She's not charged with being unfaithful. The judge is going to tell you at the end of this, she's not on trial for anything other than first degree murder. One of the things that we talked about in void our examination is your obligation as a juror. And at the close of this case, the judge is gonna give you all the instructions. But there are important safeguards that we have in our country to protect people who are charged by an offense in this country. And I'm gonna discuss those with you. I think they're very important to go over. First of all, one of the things that you're gonna talk about is the plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof. And this is gonna be over a period of time because it's a long instruction. Do you but want me to go ahead? That'd be fine, thank you. But remember folks, as it says, the defendant, Ms. MacArthur, has entered a plea of not guilty this means that you must presume or believe she's innocent. And if you remember when we were talking in voir dire examination, that was a question that I went around to every, over 70 jurors in there. And each of the jurors acknowledged, the ones that are sitting here, that they could abide by that. There were some that said, no, I can't. And we thank them for their honesty, but they acknowledged that. That's what our system is. It's not like any other system anywhere in the, in the world. You're presumed innocent. In fact, Many times, I've had cases in federal court where the, where the uh, judge will say, Mr. Veras and his client can sit there and play cards. They don't have to do anything. Just be present. Of course, we wouldn't play cards. But that's the, that's the means that the presumption of innocence follows her throughout the trial of this cause. The next thing I want to talk about, and we're still on this, is who has the burden of proof? Who has the burden of proof in this case? The state of Florida has, to has the burden of proving the crime which the defendant is charged, first degree premeditated murder, not theft, not the other things that we've heard so much evidence about, and that the defendant is the person that actually committed the crime. And we're going to talk about that because I don't think they have proved anything with respect to that. And again, it says, Ms. MacArthur is not required to prove anything. This is all part of the reasonable doubt. What is a reasonable doubt? You know, we talk about it, and the judge is going to instruct you on it, and the part that I've underlined, obviously, is one that I want you to look at, but you're going to have to consider all the instructions during the course of the trial and, all, and the thing in the totality. But it says, if after caring, carefully considering, i got an extra V in there, comparing and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction... It is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates. Then the charge is not proved beyond a reasonable doubt, 
and the court will tell you you must find her not guilty. It's their burden to prove the case. And what I like to say on something like this is, if you're in there and you say, well, she probably did it. Well, I don't know if she did it or not. I think maybe she did more than that. If you have that type of feeling and there's not a firm belief that Miss MacArthur, based upon the evidence, committed murder with a firearm, then you're obligated to find her not guilty. One of the things that you can look at is if one in their most important affairs would act without hesitation, that's the type of burden we're talking about here, act upon without hesitation. What about reasonable doubt? Reasonable doubt can arise from the evidence, the lack of evidence, or the conflict in evidence. And it says there at the bottom, if you have a reasonable doubt, you should find Ms. MacArthur not guilty. You know, we're, we're not here to solve the crime, but here to determine strictly, and the judge will tell you that, whether or not they proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a high standard, and I'll talk about that later. Obviously, the case must not be decided against anyone. Ms. Jensen said, this is a 33-year-old mother of a child. Obviously, this is a sad situation when anyone dies. You know, some people may feel angry if they suspect that Ms. MacArthur was involved in that. But you have to put those feelings of emotion aside. You have to decide the case on the facts, the evidence, the conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. That's the way the rules apply in this case. That's why we have such a wonderful country and a judicial system in the United States. People are presumed innocent, and it's a state's burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. This is another thing that we talked about in voir dire examination. Each of you sitting here before me, each of you, each one of you are a judge of this case. No one makes that decision other than you. Judge Shackelford runs the court, tells us how the court should operate, but you decide what the evidence is, what the verdict is. And as I, we talked in, in voir dire examination, I ask each of you, would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to listen to the evidence, listen to the judge's instructions, go back into the jury room after you've had all the evidence, you may have some of the things, talk among yourself, and then form an opinion based upon that evidence, lack of evidence, whether or not they've proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I ask you as well, I went around and asked, if you had a reasonable doubt, if, if something came up and you felt the case hadn't been proved, are you going to change your mind just because other people disagree with you? Nobody, I think, will do that. They'll make the decision on their own. That's what I'm asking you to do because that's the law. That's the law. Again, th th this is why I, I go over these things, and they're very important, and the judge will instruct you. The fact that Ms. MacArthur did not testify cannot be considered by you in any way. That's so, and I think you understand that because it's the state's burden. When one elects not to testify, it's the state's burden to prove the case, and you cannot consider that. You can't say, well, an innocent person would testify. That's not necessarily true. And so you have to put that aside. And I think each of you will do that. That's your sworn duty to do that. Your job is to, prove, is to determine if they prove that she killed her. As I said earlier, it's not to say, well, I wonder who did it. If she didn't do it, if somebody else did it. You're not here to determine that. It's a standard that we in the United States stand by. The state talks about opportunity and motive. I don't think you're going to hear an instruction that says, well, if someone has the opportunity and motive, they must have committed murder. She's jumping. She's jumping the fence and putting on a lot of information about theft. But we're going to talk about that and, and about the motive and the opportunity. The fact that someone is in that position doesn't mean that they individually caused the death of Miss Wright. I'm going to talk to you now about some reasonable doubts. September the 8th, September the 9th. Miss Jensen said she was killed at around noon, that's what she said, on September the 8th. She said that, nobody else said that. 
the medical examiner, Dr. Minyard, came in and testified that she could not tell you when death occurred. She said that she's seen skeletization happen within 10 days. So nobody scientifically knows when the death occurred. If the state says that's when it occurred, that's based upon what they believe the circumstances prove, but they must prove all circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. They cannot just have conjecture here. We know, and the state, the state mentioned this, that the last time there was any communication from Taylor Wright's phone was on September the 9th at 9, 11 p.m. Central Time, and they received it in uh, Eastern Time at 8, 11 Eastern Time on September the 9th. Do you remember who was using that phone then? Or how would, how would Ms. MacArthur access that phone? Because do you remember Cassandra Waller's testimony when she was talking about, you know, we had this meeting and she just didn't basically trust Taylor Wright? And she suggested that her thumb bin be put on there so that she could have access to it. So the evidence indicates, there's nothing else to indicate, that two people had access to that phone. Taylor Wright, Cassandra Waller. And the state's saying, well, the murder call occurred on noon, it's September the 8th, but there's a text message from a phone that was accessed only by Cassandra Waller and Taylor Wright. There's no evidence of otherwise. Forensic evidence. There's no forensic evidence where the murder occurred. There's nothing. <clears throat> you know, Miss Jensen talks about it happened right here. Well, she's got the, the, the murder occurring at noon on September the 8th in between that time, and yet she's claiming the body is buried sometime the next day after, I don't know, 3 o'clock or whatever uh, on September the 9th. <clears throat> where was the body during this period of time? I mean, this is a human being, a body laying somewhere. There must be some evidence where it was. Was it in the truck? There's no forensic evidence. That's her statement. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And, and we did talk about Taylor Wright. She did have a uh, sort of a volatile situation. You know, Taylor Wright, you know, one of the witnesses testified she'd do anything in this divorce to get the upper hand. She, told, she apparently took $100,000. She was a cocaine user. She wasn't trusted enough by Cassandra Waller <clears throat> unless she could have her thumbprint on the phone and see where Taylor Wright was going. If you rec well, that was her testimony. And the fact of the matter is she had had an affair with somebody on Biloxi. Uh, she, they had a meeting at Ms. MacArthur's house sometime to discuss these problems. And they went over to talk to her about it. And, and, and apparently Cassandra Waller and uh, Taylor Wright had a meeting there. And that's when I guess they decided they were going to put her thumbprint on the phone so that she could trace her. But in any event, there's a lot of things that we don't know about Taylor Wright. One of the things that the state has talked about is motive for money. Do you remember Brandon Beatty says, from the time I met, from the time I met Miss MacArthur, that she was helping me, giving me money, so on. It didn't start after July of 2017. This theory about the motive was because July of 2017, she needed money to buy Brandon Beatty things. If you look at the text messages, one of these messages in here, It's in Government Exhibit 134, and I put a flag on it. It's going to be on page, at least at the bottom, it says page 4925. And it says, this is from uh, Taylor Wright. I need to get the keys to the safety deposit box. I've got this ring in there, and I can't be running around with $50,000 in my bag. 
That is on August the 29th, 2017. August the 29th, 2017. The money was deposited in the account mid-August 15. This is right near the time when she, uh, they last heard Taylor Wright. So she hadn't been using Taylor Wright's money to, to uh, help Brandon B with his business or buying guns or giving guns. She had been doing that long, long because she had a cash business. And you got, you see in there, there's exhibit 14. The state's already shown it to you. That in exhibit the 14, there's a receipt there for July the 25th, 2017 for the purchase of the boat. And I don't think that receipt said 30000 I think it said a down payment or something to that effect. But in any event, you'll have that in there to look at. But anyway, we know that at least on August the 29th, Taylor Wright had most of the money. 50000 in a bag, she said. We know they deposited 34000 in a cashier's check that she had. And we know that there was... Or the, and we know that there was a $19,000 cashier's check found later. Add that up, it comes to $103,000, which is what she took from her husband. I think I put all that up there. I just tend to go on without these things. Any event, let's talk about this big conspiracy to poison um, Taylor Wright. If you remember, we're talking about September the 7th. This is an important date, September the 7th, 2017. Alexis Cook, Audrey Potts, Jessica Wheeler had testified. Remember, there was some testimony on the night of September 7th, an allegation that, that apparently the next day, uh, she was texted or received a telephone call on September the 8th that she had put some cocaine in Taylor Wright's beer, but it tasted bad in the morning. Now, let's look at the timeline. Alexis Cook, who testified, admitted she's a convicted felon, and the judge will tell you you can consider that. She also acknowledged on cross-examination that she did investigation on Facebook, looked on social media to find out about the case, and that she did this before she went in and talked to the police. Alexis Cook said she saw cocaine in the hands of, of them. I guess she's referring to Taylor Wright and Audrey Potts. Excuse me, uh, Miss MacArthur and Audrey Potts. And she said she saw cocaine on the table. Audrey Potts, who, who purportedly went with Miss MacArthur to visit T, said she saw some money, but she never saw any cocaine. When they got back, she never saw any cocaine. Jessica Wheeler was there, and she said she never saw any cocaine. And they both said that, she, as I understand, uh, she was not a part of the conversation about this, this putting cocaine in her beer, referring to uh, Alexis Cook. Now, that couldn't have happened for two reasons, and I'm going to explain why. Cassandra Waller said on September the 7th, the day before, that she and Taylor Wright were at Twin Peaks. They didn't expect Miss MacArthur to come, but Miss MacArthur joined them. Cassandra Waller said that Taylor Wright and, and Cassandra went home to Cassandra Waller's house and spent the night, and they never saw Miss MacArthur until 10 o'clock the next day. Okay? That's one reason it couldn't have happened. Because Taylor Wright was not with them on September the 7th. She was home. And now the state's come up with some theory about, well, possibly put beer in the next day. We'll talk about that. On September the 7th, it, it sticks. Audrey Potts and Jessica Wheeler were drinking. Uh, Miss MacArthur was drinking. They acknowledged that they had shots, if you recall. And some said, well, were you drunk? Well, not at the time, but we had more shots than later we were. Well, we know from Audrey Potts and from a picture that was put in by the state that Ashley MacArthur 
was at Sticks Lounge on the evening of September 8th until the morning, uh, evening of September 7th, until the morning of September 8th at 2 a.m. because Audrey Potts said, I took a picture of her and put a thing over her. She was passed out on the floor. So there was no putting any cocaine in anybody's drink. And Audrey Potts said, well, she called the next day and told me that. Well, I don't know what they talked about, but we do know, even by the evidence that they put in, that there was no beer bought before about noon or 11 o'clock. So nothing happened in the morning. Because she said she called her in the morning. You know what it was? It's a bunch of drunken talk. That's all it is. It doesn't show any intent to harm or kill anyone. <coughs> okay. There's no DNA. There's no DNA linking Miss MacArthur to Taylor Wright's death. There's no trace or scientific evidence linking her. There was a search on September the 18th, knock and announce, at, eight, at the Rain Tree address. The police didn't tell her they were coming. They said, we might come and visit you, but the officer acknowledged they didn't know when she was coming. Detective Gigliotti had full access to Miss Wright's, um, excuse me, Miss MacArthur's house at Rain Tree on September the 18th approximately 10 days after anyone heard from uh, Taylor Wright. They walked around. He said he looked in the bedrooms. He looked in the basement. He looked in the closets. He looked in the bathroom. He was looking for evidence. He's a detective. He saw nothing, found nothing. We know that they then searched the house on October the 19th with a search warrant. We then know they searched the house on October the 24th with another search warrant. They collected hundreds of items, items for forensic evidence, shorts in the basement, anything that could have any DNA or connection to that. Guns, there was everything there. There were a lot of guns in that house. You saw some of the pictures. They found nothing to connect Miss MacArthur to the death. We're talking about physical evidence when we're talking about prosecuting somebody for first degree murder. Evidence that shows that she pulled the trigger and killed Taylor Wright. And let's talk about the gun. We know that Brandon Beatty got a lot of guns from her. No question about it. She gave her Taylor Wright's guns. Miss McArthur gave her guns, AK or I think it was AR-15s, shotguns, Kimbers, Glocks. All, this was something she did and had been doing for a long time. The state, and I, I think she showed you this, which is Defense Exhibit Number 11. This is the bullet. This is the bullet that they recovered from Taylor Wright's skull. The state let it hang at that. You know, this is a similar firearm this picture of this 38. But I was able to get, through the state by request, a copy of all the firearms that could file, fire that. Now, this is the model numbers. This is the brands, Ruger, Smith & Wesson, Taurus, pages and pages. INAs, Ruger, H&R, US, any one of these guns manufactured by these manufacturers could have fired a 38 class bullet, which includes a 38, a 357 Magnum, a 380, and I think it's a 9 millimeter Ruger. Any of them. And this is just a list of the guns, manufacturers. For every one of these guns, there are thousands of guns that are produced. So, they take a picture of a 38. They could have taken a picture of everything and try and tell you that this gun was used in this. Well, Miss Ritchie, who is a F firearms expert, said when looking for a comparison, she could not, the, the, the uh, bullet was not suitable for comparison. If it's not suitable for comparison, what the state is doing is they're putting in a bullet and says, does it have a couple grooves like it? 
trying to get you to con be convinced that that's proof of something beyond a reasonable doubt. These circumstances have to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. It would be just like this. Say we have a fingerprint expert, and he gets a fingerprint, and he says, this fingerprint isn't suitable for comparison, but there was one ridge detail on there, and that could have come from Barry Barossa's hands. That's, that's not comparison. She said it couldn't be compared. It's no evidence in this case. The gun is no evidence in this case, and it doesn't link Miss MacArthur to the murder of Taylor Wright. There is no gun that's been introduced that does that. The truck. What about the truck? They searched the truck, the 254, the black Jeep, the white Jeep, but on the 250 Ford, they believe that was the, the uh, vehicle that was used the day of the murder. And they believe that they could get forensic evidence off of that. So they took evidence from all parts of it, the door, the handles, the back seat. And they did recover a mixed DNA of an unidentified male in the back seat. But they found nothing to link Miss MacArthur to the death of Taylor Wright. Motive. Motive isn't proof. We all have ideas or motives at time. That doesn't mean we act upon them. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she acted upon them and murdered somebody. Here's the kicker, and I'm going to talk about this first. I think I got it on here. The concrete. Right here. The concrete. You have photographs. She put one of them up on the screen, a big one, and you saw the concrete. The concrete had pebbles or rocks like in it, little round stones, which concrete has that you're using on a sidewalk or paving or something like that. If any of you work with concrete, that concrete was rough concrete. And Miss Jensen, after Devontae Sims had testified about uh, Miss MacArthur coming in and purchased concrete. She said, oh, he purchased a 50-pound bag, a 40-pound bag. Uh, she purchased two bags of soil. She got back up on redirect and says, what was the texture of that? And he said, I'm going to quote him, fine like dust. Let me tell you something. If the concrete that she purchased isn't the concrete there, they don't have a concrete case. They don't have strong evidence because the person who covered it up used some other concrete. It is not the concrete that she purchased. You know, the other thing, let's, let's face it. You know, this case is two years old almost. They've had a lot of evidence over the time. They knew the exact brand of that concrete both of them. You saw the brand. You saw the price tags. They knew the exact brands of the potting soil. Why didn't they test it? They didn't test it. It's a big question. The concrete is different on that body, those remains, than the concrete she purchased, because she purchased fine concrete like dust. You know, on her back problems, I talked about that. I didn't say Miss MacArthur couldn't kayak or couldn't hunt or anything like that. All we put in there is evidence to show that in 2010, Miss Macbar MacArthur had an accident. It was a serious accident, as Dr. Roberts testified. He testified about the injury, and it wouldn't heal itself. She's never had any, any surgery since. So we know that she had a back injury. And her mother testified that she's always had trouble lifting heavy things. Her, her um, employee said they always got help if it was something heavy. So let's just look at this. If she was running around, pulling this body, lifting this body, putting 90 pounds of concrete on, on September the 9th or se and moving the body on September the 8th, wouldn't you think you'd see something to indicate that? You got a video. Video at Tom Thumbs on September the 8th, when they went, it's about noon, when they went there 
and she purchased a beer. And remember I told you earlier, there was no beer in the morning anywhere. That's just what they're saying. But in any event, you can see her. She walks in there. You see anything that indicates like she's been stressed out or anything? She's got on nice clothes. She's clean. Nothing to indicate that she's been uh, or planning to kill somebody. We don't even know if Taylor Wright was in the car at that time. We do not know that. On September the 9th, that was on September the 8th. On September the 9th, you got a video of her going to Home Depot and talking to Devontae Sims. What did Devontae Sims say? He helped her load the, the uh, two bags of concrete and the soil in the front of the vehicle. Uh, he said, we talked about her Jeep. He liked her black Jeep. This, this wasn't a person that just killed somebody. There's no evidence of any dishevelment. There's no evidence that she's stressed. There's no evidence that she's under adrenaline effect, as the state has suggested, that she could pick up people. I don't know if any of you ever deer hunted, but you kill a 130-pound deer, and it's hard to move a body. It's hard to move. And also, on September the 8th, she met her husband, Zach MacArthur. Miss, Miss MacArthur met her husband at the Blackwater Bistro. He said she was normal, just like her normal self. On September the 9th, she went to a wedding with Zach MacArthur. Then he came back separately, or she came back separately. She was normal. You've seen enough on television. You see what happens when somebody's traumatized, uh, if they've done something, if they killed somebody, or if they've seen somebody kill somebody, you just don't turn that on and off. There's nothing to indicate anything in her demeanor through these videos that they've got that they put in, or her clothing or her dishevelment that indicates that she was killing somebody or dragging somebody's body around. There's nothing there. And that's strong evidence, physical evidence that you can see, not something that the state is suggesting. You know, we talked about all the searches. We talked about the lack of any evidence as far as any physical evidence of the murder. Because this is what we're here about. We're here about a murder case, the most serious ch crime you can be charged with. We're not here on any other fence. But look at this. Maybe she did it. It's possible she did it. You suspect she did it? Probable cause is what it takes to arrest somebody? That's what it takes? If you're in a civil case and there's no presumption of innocence, the burden of proof is by clear and convincing evidence. If you're in a violation of probation or something like that, it's proof by preponderance of the evidence, a greater burden. If they want to take your child away from you, they have to prove it by clear and convincing evidence. Clear and convincing evidence beyond and to the certain of every reasonable doubt is the highest burden that can be afforded someone. And that's what the state has to prove and prove that Miss MacArthur killed with premeditated design Taylor Bryant. Not that she was out at the farm, not that she lied about it, not that she had some money of hers. They've got to prove that the crime occurred. And they don't have any physical evidence. They have none. You know, when you get back there, I know you're going to have to look at all the evidence, take your time, and as the judge says, you know, you'll tell you you've got all the time you need to deliberate, whatever it takes, not no deadline. But when, when you do that, eventually you're going to come to a decision. You're going to get a verdict for them. And the verdict form is going to have several things. First degree premeditated murder. Second degree murder. Then they'll have some blanks whether with a firearm or whether a firearm was charged. Manslaughter, then whether a firearm was charged. And at the very end, they have not guilty. When you consider the evidence and the burden that the state has, I ask you to do your duty in this case because there is a reasonable doubt, and I ask you to return a verdict of not guilty of Ms. MacArthur. Thank you.
All right, thank you.